if you don't have self-belief, you're not unbelievably confident that you're going to do great things, and perhaps this is a subset and a way of very high expectations as well, then you won't do it. And the difference between 99.99% of people and the other tiny proportion of people who do change the world is that the latter believe that they can. My name's Michael Campion, and welcome to another episode of Playing the Inner Game, the podcast where I sit down with exceptional thinkers and communicators to try and figure out what really motivates them, what drives them, what is special about their lens on the world. My guests come from all across the board. We'll listen to creatives and CEOs, actors and artists, Olympic athletes and entrepreneurs. They all share in common a level of mastery in their respective fields and understand intuitively that developing one's inner game is necessary for having an impact on the outer world. Whomever I speak to, my responsibility is always to you, the listener, to dig a little deeper than other shows, to pull on the right threads and distill the best of their wisdom and give it to you so that I can help you become healthier, wealthier, happier and wiser. My guest today is Richard Koch, management consultant, entrepreneur and writer of several books, his seminal work being The 80-20 Principle, one of the most successful business books of all time, which has been translated into over 30 languages. It's sold well over a million copies to date. In a nutshell, the book is about how to achieve more with less. It's about recognizing those natural asymmetries between inputs and outputs, and recognizing that a very small subset of activities and inputs accounts for 80% of your outcomes. So 80% of your happiness is derived from 20% of all your activities. 80% of your revenues in a business tend to stem from about 20% of your customers. So it's all about focusing your efforts and leveraging that small number of activities that really move the needle. I've so admired the way this man's brain works for such a long time. Reading the 8020 principle many, many years ago has influenced me perhaps more than any other business book out there. So it's a real honor and a privilege to have him on the show. Richard used the concepts articulated in the 80-20 principle and his subsequent books to make a fortune from several private equity investments. He's personally invested early in the likes of Filofax, Plymouth Gin, and most notably Betfair. I ask him a little bit about what he saw there in the early days that signaled to him that this was a good investment opportunity. Prior to becoming an author, Richard was a very successful management consultant. It didn't actually start out that well, as he himself will explain. He was first at BCG and later made partner at Bain. Just to give a little context for those of you who aren't immediately familiar with the landscape of the management consulting world, BCG, Bain, McKinsey, these are the three titans of the industry and the brightest graduates from all the world's top universities battle it out for a job there every single year. So they are the elite, the best of the best. He ended up leaving Bain actually to start his own firm, LEK, back in 1983 with partners Jim Lawrence and Ian Evans, a firm that now employs thousands of people worldwide, very successful in its own right. And we talk about the best bits that Richard took from the culture and practices of each of those firms. So just to paint a picture for you, uh, quite rightly, Richard is enjoying the fruits of his labors. He is dialing in from the Algarve in Portugal, recording podcasts over Zoom with little old me. The only downside being that the internet connection is a touch choppy in parts, being out in the remote countryside, beautiful as it is, but only slightly, as I said. He's such a good speaker, it doesn't detract at all from the weight of what he is saying. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to give you Richard Kosh. I thought a good jumping off point for the podcast might be the theme of expectations shaping outcome. So one of my favorite stories that you've told before, which, which I absolutely loved, was the story of how Bill Bain made you a partner without making you a partner, if you can recall the story that I'm talking about yes, yeah, yeah. With, the, with that nine-month gestation period. So could you just talk to me about what you think was so clever about that? Because I, I really thought that was such a clever psychological tool that, that Bill used with you. I've always thought about expectation shaping outcomes. So I'd love to hear how you kind of resonate with that idea. I was a complete failure in the Boston Consulting Group, uh, despite trying extremely hard and, of course, being extremely bright 
um, I <laughs> utterly, utterly failed to do what they, what they regarded as the sine qua non, the absolute requirement of a strategy consultant, which was you had to be very, very good at heavy duty quantitative analysis. And I was very good with patterns and concepts, but I wasn't, <laughs> I was very good with clients, <laughs> in case of myself. But, but Bill Bain was a most remarkable person who's ever worked in strategy consulting because he didn't have a business degree. In fact, he didn't have a degree in any scientific or quantitative background at all, which of course made him you know, resonate with me yeah. um, because he was a historian. I actually studied, having done history, he uh, studied as a postgraduate. And then he got very, very bored with that. History was also my subject, so that was very fortunate. Um, anyway, uh, to cut a long story short, after uh, desperately trying to succeed at the Boston Consulting Group, they effectively fired me. And I looked around for a job and I managed to get an interview with Bill Bain in Boston, um, Massachusetts. And he, um, he and I got on ex extremely well together. Uh, I listened to what he was saying and I was very interested in the formula. How do you be successful in a strategy consulting firm? But you've some experience of that. With, with Bill, he had a formula and he proceeded according to certain principles that he set his business up. And some of them were extremely strategic, as for example, the idea that the, his firm shouldn't work for anybody except the top dog, the chief executive officer in a company. Um, and, you know, he, he turned down the opportunity to work on projects which were for other board members or head of manufacturing or the head of um, international or the head of a particular country or function. Um, so some of them were strategic ideas, but the one which um, we're talking about here was really a tactical idea. And this was the idea that if you promoted somebody, you could sort of promote them without promoting them. Uh, and what he did was to uh, sit down with me about a year and a half after I joined his company as a plain old consultant. They had promoted me to manage pretty quickly. Um, and, and so he asked to see me when he visited London because I was working in the London office. And I sat down with him and I thought it was just going to be a nice little chat. And he would say, how are you doing? And I would say, I'm doing fine, Bill. It's really nice working in your company. And maybe we talk a, a little bit about the, you know, the clients I was working on. But no, actually, he's, he's, he had absolutely flawed me um, about five minutes into the conversation. I say, well... Richard, yes, we could talk about that, but I've got a little agenda. And one thing I want to talk about is this. I said, okay, Bill. And he said, I want you to become my partner. And I could have fallen off my chair uh, at that. <laughs> I can see it. Yeah. Because it was, sort of, it was sort of thing that I had hoped might happen in two or three years' time after that. And um, <laughs> I said to him, are you kidding me? And he said, no, I'm absolutely serious. He said, there is, there is a slight catch to it, though, Richard. Um, and the catch is that, that, you know, it's a done deal. We've decided, or I've decided, because he was pretty autocratic, uh, that, that, you know, I want you to be my partner. But it ain't going to happen for the next nine months. It's definite. Don't worry about it. But um, I'm going to announce it along with other people in nine months' time. And why, why... Are you going to uh, do that, Bill? Uh, he said rhetorically to himself. And he said, it's because when it's announced, I want everyone to say it's obvious. It's obvious that Richard, although he hasn't been in the firm for very long, should be a partner of the firm. And he said, the way that that's going to work, Richard, is you're going to behave for the next nine months as if you are a partner. But you're, you don't have the title and you don't have the authority but nevertheless, you are going to assume that you're a partner and fulfill that role. And you're going to interact with people in a way that a partner would normally do, except that, of course, you can't tell them directly to do something. But he said, you're smart enough to work out how to be nice to people and how to get them to do something uh, without the authority, because it's obvious that it should be done, because you know what should be done and so on. And that had an enormous impact on me. It completely changed my perspective on the work that I was doing. Instead of thinking of myself principally 
as someone who was a unit of production um, on his own, who would talk to clients and you know think about uh, what was important to prove in the study and how to crack the case. Uh, I thought about myself someone who was there to extract the best possible results from the team of people that I worked with or from, from anyone that I came across in the firm and to help them. Um, and that therefore resulted in a very productive nine month period, which was probably much more productive than the following <laughs> period after. Uh, he kept his word, you know, the announcement, yeah. the announcement was made. <laughs> so, so you know, it was it was a very very interesting experience. And as you say, expectations are are everything. You know, it's notable that with one exception, perhaps, once someone's elevated to a particular role, they become prime minister of Great Britain, for example, or president of the United States. As I say, perhaps with one exception, they grow into that role, and they therefore. Um, uh, become a different person because everyone calls them Mr. President and, you know, is expected that they will be statesman-like, uh, again, with perhaps one exception. And uh, it was um, remarkable that that actually worked, you know, at, at a completely different level, obviously, but it worked in the strategy consulting firm. And I think if you tell people that they can do something, and you tell them that they you know, have got to have very high standards in doing it, then it's an amazing thing. I mean, one of the things that, that Jeff Bezos at, at Amazon has done very, very successfully is he's elevated the idea that they're a very elite force at the top anyway in Amazon, and that they um, really do have to meet very high standards. And anyone that's on the team has to meet very high standards. And he says high standards are contagious, Yes, and the opposite is also true. That if you don't have high standards, you know people don't 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 meet high standards because they don't have to, or or because the other people around them are not behaving in that way. Yeah. So yeah, so that was that was my little story. Can you think of other applications of that? Because I'd like to. It's such a good yeah. idea. No, it's a, it's such a good idea. So you know, first of all, there's a there's a lovely quote that I'll share with you, and I'll probably mangle it because I'm not reading off of a screen. But it goes something along the lines of, if I treat you as you are, I do you a disservice. But if I treat you for what you might become, then I help you become that. And for me, I, I just, you know, that quote made me think of your story with, with Bill Bain and how he promoted you without promoting you. But it, it kind of forced you to develop and increased your motivation and your loyalty to him and both the firm. My, my other, to answer your question more precisely, the other application I can think of for me is, is actually with parenting is a non-obvious application of that, right? So kind of the expectations that you, hmm. that you set with your children and making sure that you set the bar high, regardless of what others might say or society might expect of them. And the same goes for teachers, right? For teachers and parents, I think just kind of the, the affirmation and the belief of one teacher or one parent or one coach can, I think, completely change the trajectory of a young person's life. That was my kind of non-obvious application or maybe obvious. I mean, there's, there is that wonderful piece of psychological research, and I'm not a fan of, of psychological research general because of all <laughs> But there was a case in, I think it was actually in the late 1950s, where uh, teachers were told that there were a group of people in their class who were of exceptional ability and potential. And, and that they shouldn't communicate that either directly or indirectly to the pupils involved, but they just bear it in mind. And what they had done is they, they tested a group of children and then they retested the children uh, nine months later. And the children who had been identified as having had great potential had actually advanced in IQ on average by 20%. And some of them had gone up as much as 30%. Now, that's a huge increase in Enormous. IQ. Yeah. You know, it's a 20% to 30% increase. But the teachers have not actually communicated that to the, the children. Now, the, the, the thing was that, as they often do in experiments, the psychologists had lied that, that actually the children who'd been identified as having exceptional potential had been selected because they were average. And so, you know, you had this enormous effect of expectations, not even directly communicated uh, to children. 
And again, one of the things that I've seen um, some of my um, family do with their um, children is they praise them when they do something right. And that creates an expectation that, that they will continue to do that thing. And it's very, actually it's very similar to something I had with Bill Bain in, the, in my first conversation with him, which was, I referred to something that he'd said 20 minutes earlier in the conversation, because we'd been carrying on talking about something. And he said, I want to go back, Bill, to something that you said before. And if I understood you correctly, you said some da dum da dum da And he said to me, gosh, he said, Richard, you're a very good listener. Uh, because most people don't listen and you're referring to something that was 20 minutes ago in the conversation and indeed I did say something like that and then we we talk, talked about that no one had ever said to me before Michael that you're a good listener mm. uh, probably because I wasn't uh, and, <laughs> but I made a point after that of trying to listen and I also made a point after that of trying to pick out something that I thought each of the people working for me was particularly good at doing and then saying you know you're very good at analysis aren't you or you're very you're very good with clients and it is notable that if you do that it does tend to have an effect so yes i think expectations are hugely important yeah yeah it's such um i mean it must have been an enormous privilege i know he was such a mentor of yours to to work you know for and alongside someone like bill bain um if i can kind of link that theme of expectations granted by others into one of the, the themes of your latest book, uh, which I very happily read and enjoyed reading. You use the metaphor of a map, dotting it with nine major landmarks right on the, on the landscape of success. And one of them is, of course, having Olympian expectations, right? I mean, how important do you think, do you think that is as well, rather, you know, not just expectations granted to you by other people? Yes, well, it's uh, very important, obviously. I, I, the way I wrote the book was that I... I've been fascinated, always fascinated by success. And why was it, or why is it, that some people are enormously successful when other people who are their peers or often people who are ahead of them in the, in the race to success or appear to be, um, actually fall by the wayside? What is it about some people which means that they have what I call unreasonable success? And unreasonable success means several things. It means firstly that it's a fantastic impact on the world, so it's unreasonable for any one individual to have that impact. But it also means that it's unreasonable in the sense that you wouldn't have thought that these were the people who were going to be incredibly successful. I mean, even someone like uh, Albert Einstein, who's in the book, who you know, everyone thinks of as absolute genius, wasn't. I mean, the thing about Albert Einstein was that he was actually uh, not very good at school because he wasn't particularly interested in, in doing what, uh, in learning by rote, essentially, which was the way that, that people were taught then. Um, he um, didn't go to the best university in Zurich. He went to the Polytechnic rather than the proper university. And he graduated near the bottom of his class. And one of the subjects that he was very weak in was mathematics. <laughs> but, so, you know, but the thing about Albert Einstein was that he had fantastic expectations of himself. And uh, he didn't care really what other people thought about it. Uh, he thought that he was a genius, whatever, whatever the data said. And, yeah. and you know, I mean, it, it's truly, truly and utterly amazing. So what I did in the book was to try and say, well, I'm going to take 20 people that I know were unreasonably successful. They weren't expected in their early life to succeed. And they weren't terribly successful early on. They all had major setbacks of one sort or another. And I'm going to um, try and identify characteristics, experiences or attitudes of those people that were common to all 20. So I started with a list of 20 attributes that I thought might conceivably lead to success. For example, one of the ones which dropped out because it wasn't universally true was people who take high risks. My expectation was that all of these people would, would indeed turn out to have taken high risks. And some of them did, like Winston Churchill was in the book. He took very, very high risks. But others, like uh, Bruce Henderson, my other mentor, founder of the Boston Consulting Group, who was also in the book, he never took a significant risk in his life. So, you know, I, I then discarded that hypothesis. And I was left with, as you say, nine landmarks 
which astonishingly were common to all of these people. Some of them were pretty obvious ones, uh, like use of intuition rather than rational logic. But some of the uh, uh, landmarks were things that I had not expected. Um, one of them was a transforming experience. I, I happened to notice that some of these people actually had a stage in their life which could be a year or two years or three years. In some cases, it was four hours, actually. In one case, it was four mm -hmm. hours. But it was you know, typically about a, a, a year. When they went into the experience as one person and they came out of the experience as another person, immensely in, increased in confidence and in knowledge, rare knowledge. And very often, it was going into an organisation that knew something that other organisations did not know. And this applied to Jeff Bezos, who would never have been successful had he not, at the age of 26, as someone who failed on Wall Street and hated being a hedge fund manager and hated all those belts of the red braces and the, you know, the arrogance of these masters of the universe. Uh, but he was sent at the last minute when he was about to throw up his whole career as an investment person uh, to uh, David Shaw, who was an ex-computer scientist professor and who had started very recently a company called de shaw and company uh, after himself and this was set up as a highly quantitative i would never have worked and succeed in this but they'd never have hired me. <laughs> but it was a very highly <laughs> quantitative hedge fund which yeah. did alternative investments based on all kinds of weird and wonderful algorithms but that wasn't really what appealed to um, what appealed to uh, Jeff Bezos. What appealed to him when he went to meet David Shaw is that David Shaw appeared to be confident of something that no one else at the time, this was back in 1992, was confident about, which was that the internet was going to be fabulous for selling products. Now, everyone thought the internet was going to be great for communication and it was going to be great for spreading knowledge and all the rest of it. But very few people, in fact, almost nobody, thought that it was going to be a great way to sell products and services. After all, you know, that no one was doing it. And the project that David Shaw got Jeff Bezos to work on was something that he called the Everything Store, which was where you would sell everything over the internet, but you would start with one particular category. And that category turned out to be books. And actually, you know, that's, it's obvious, isn't it, now? But, but what they were working on was the prototype for what became Amazon. When he thought it was such a great idea, he went to David and said, I want to do this myself. And astonishingly, after walking around Central Park for a couple of hours, and David Shaw trying to persuade Jeff that it was far better to do it within the embrace of the Shaw and Company, where he would have no risk and he would basically call on other people to, to help him launch this thing. Uh, no, he was absolutely determined, Bezos was, that he wanted to do it on his own. And David Shaw said, yes, OK, all right, off you go, Jeff, that's fine. <laughs> he didn't even ask for a share in the company. I mean, it's just truly amazing and generous. Uh, yeah. because he thought that he, he perhaps he didn't think that this particular project was going to be a huge success but but and he you know carried on with his quantitative hedge fund which is you know it's since been amazingly successful the point was that Bezos who was a raw 26 year old before and he didn't know what he was going to do knew that that was his destiny knew that that was going to be his life and knew how to do it because David Shaw and he had already worked out that books was the first category to start on and then Bezos added his own unique twist to it so anyway that was his transforming experience and other transforming experiences were extremely unpleasant some of them um one of them for Vladimir Lenin was seeing his elder brother or hearing that his elder brother had been hanged uh, for plotting to assassinate the Tsar of Russia. Um, one of them was um, actually Viktor Frankl, the very eminent psychotherapist who had pioneered the third wave of psych uh, psychoanalysis after Freud and Adler, um, was sent to a concentration camp, or was actually more than one, by Adolf Hitler. And that was his transforming experience. I, I won't go into the story of why that was so important to him, but, but um, you know, all of these people had transforming experiences. 
And therefore, I then said, well, so reverse engineered it a little bit. If having a transforming experience was so important or is so important to these people who were so, so successful, even though in many cases that transforming experience happened against their will or accidentally, wouldn't it be a good idea if we want to make more people who are going to be hugely successful and unreasonably successful to actually say you ought to go and have uh, a transforming experience? If Well, first thing, have you had one? Has there been a period in your life which you've been fundamentally changed in terms of your power, authority, confidence, knowledge, and so on and so forth? Um, and if not, then perhaps you, sh you should have one of those. Um, and then we can work out how, you know, how to expose yourself to the possible opportunity of doing that. In a company, if it, you know, the thing to do is to identify a very small company that's growing very fast. If a small company is growing very fast, it doesn't start with any great advantages. And therefore, you might work out that, that it knows something that other people don't. And if you know something that other people don't, like the fact the internet was going to be wonderful for e-tailing, for retailing, then uh, you know that's something that you can use subsubsequently in another field or, or in a you know, slightly different field. And in a way, that's what I've done with, with Mike, because what I did was to discover in BCG, even though they fired me, that the what I call the star principle was very important, very important for investment and very important for having a successful company. Because BCG identified that, that almost all, or perhaps more than 100% of cash flow over the life of companies was created by companies which were or had been star businesses by their definition. And as, as many of your listeners may know, the definition of a star business by Boston Consulting Group is it is the leader in a niche or market which is growing very fast. And uh, that's what I have based my investment uh, career on. I mean, since I stopped being um, a management consultant, a strategy consultant, or, or founder of a strategy consulting firm, what I um, have done is two things. One is I've write, written books, which, you know, is my uh, feeble attempt at, at, at creating, um, you know, minor work of art, uh, if I can put it that like that. And also of putting down the principles, which I think are important for people to be happy and successful. And the other investment, an investment, I, you know, I don't want to be too boastful, but, but by using the star principle, I've been you know, ridiculously and quite unreasonably successful. It's not my genius, it's the power of the concept. And yet, I don't think there's a single investment firm in the world yet, maybe someone listening to this will decide to, to found it. Uh, where they base all of their investments on the star principle, which I've done for 37 years. I've mm -hmm. managed to have what's now a 23% compound annual growth rate on average in, in assets, um, purely from only investing in star businesses uh, very early on in their career, yeah. uh, very, very early on in their life. So anyway, these nine um, uh, landmarks, are described in the book Unreasonable Success, and I also discuss how to do it. For example, one of the landmarks is self-belief. <clears throat> if you don't have self-belief, you're not unbelievably confident that you're going to do great things, and perhaps this is a subset and a way of very high expectations as well, then you won't do it. And the difference between 99.99% of people and the other tiny proportion of people who do change the world is that the latter believe that they can. So then I discuss, well, how do you get self-belief? You know, and, and, you know, I tell the story in the book about my very humiliating experience at the age of nine when my aunt, Auntie Louise, was a wonderful, lovely human being, but her companion was a bit of a dragon. Miss Gates was her name. And I remember when I was nine years old, I was doodling in a book, and she came into the room. There was no one else there, and I thought, oh, <laughs> Miss Gates, I'm alone with Miss Gates is the problem. <laughs> and she said to me, Richard, what what are you going to do when you grow up? You know, what are you going to be? What job are you going to have? And I had no idea at all. You're nine. I Come on. So you know, she then said, Well, well, <laughs> I said, well, she had said, Come on. <laughs> yes, exactly. She said, Come on, tell me. So I blurted out the first thing I could think of, which was, I'm going to be a millionaire. 
And up to that time, I hadn't really thought very much, but I must have somewhere in my unconscious mind, I thought that I'd like to make a lot of money, but I wasn't really conscious of that. And she went, tup, tup. She said, no, that's ridiculous. You know, your father hasn't got any money, never will have, neither will you. You know, come on, be realistic. You know, you know what do you think you're going to do? Uh, what job are you going to have? And I said, oh, I want to be a millionaire. <laughs> <laughs> I was getting... I was getting quite uh, quite uh, upset and also quite stubborn at that stage. And she said, ah, sir, the boy won't listen to reason and stormed out of the room <laughs> in a flurry of skirts. As I, I seem to remember it anyway. But, but, you know, that set me off on the path of saying, well, what do I need to do if I want to make a lot of money? And uh, I, ident- I identified that I needed to do very well in examinations, which I'd never done up until then. And I needed to go to a good university and I needed to get a good degree and then I needed to get a good job. Well, that sort of, it didn't lead me to be a millionaire because that's not the way to get, get rich. But, it, but just thinking about that and having a few successes with exams and so on and feeling that I was on my way did give me a lot of self-confidence and therefore power. Um, and then I came across the 80-20 principle, but that's, that's another story. It's interesting how something that was said to you when you were nine years old still resonates to this day, right? (laughs) That it's stayed with you for that long. And I know that you are contrarian by nature. I think, you know, we're cut from a similar cloth that way. Um, I I like to think of myself as a diplomatic and polite contrarian, as I I guess you do too. But do you think... Oh, no, 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 I'm not telling you. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, I've got that wrong. I've got that wrong. If I really have to be, (laughs) Michael... If I must, if I must. But, um, you know, I think, do you think kind of the source of motivation for you comes from, do you enjoy proving people wrong? Because I know I do. So I wonder if that was kind of a driver for you. Oh, it was absolutely. Yes, I was determined to prove Miss Gates wrong. Yeah, love it. And I sort of, you know, when I did eventually become a millionaire, well, I think I was about 30 years old at that stage, I thought about Miss Gates and unfortunately, well, Unfortunately for her as well, I suppose. She was dead. <laughs> she, maybe, she, maybe she could turn in her grave, but she couldn't do anything else. Uh, but um, yeah. I'm sure she didn't even think about me or, or, or that ambition. But it, was, yeah. it is very helpful sometimes to be told that you can't do something. Agreed. And the same was true, uh, actually, of Albert Einstein. Uh, uh, you know, one of his teachers said to him, you're a very bright boy. Albert, but you have one great flaw, and that is you can't be told anything. You know, you don't you don't listen to what other people say. You only listen to what you say. And so the story goes. He said, "Well, yes, that's right, isn't it?" <laughs> but he didn't regret it. Uh, that, yeah. was, that was the thing. Yeah, I want to go back. Hopefully, using my listening skills here to a couple of minutes ago when you talked about kind of your investment strategy, and this is something that. Obviously, I find very interesting. You you have been unreasonably successful. You know, the Betfair investment springs to mind. Um, but what are some of the some of the rules, some of the you know heuristics or, or philosophical raises you use? Maybe just good questions that you use to ascertain whether something is a good opportunity. Over and above, you obviously the eighty twenty principle. Are there any other kind of heuristics that you use? Because just just kind of top of mind when you said that you can't think of any other investment firms that use the star principle as kind of the foundation for their investment thesis or investment strategy my gut feeling was okay maybe one of the reasons is because <laughs> managers especially in finance they actually like complexity because complexity obfuscates it hides and it's just gloriously you know simple uh, artfully simple kind of the, the principles that you talk about what are your thoughts on that well, I, I agree with you, but I mean, the truth is that the world is very complex mm-hmm. and there are loads and loads of factors that you can um, think about. And the people who are very good at investing in venture capital have developed uh, certain techniques which are fully respectful of nuance and complexity. And one of the mysterious things that they believe is very important is the management team and particularly the chief executive. Now, you know, who could disagree with that? <clears throat> Except me, of course. Um, because 
that's that is of course it's hugely important but that's one way of, of doing it you know one of the other things which they do is they say well they look for underpriced companies well that's kind of a tautology as far as i'm concerned uh what i've always tried to do in my life and it's it's really difficult to do this even i find it difficult to do this and to live by this to be honest is to be a total reductionist and say, well, what are the one or two or three or four, and again, this is just 80-20 principle in a way, uh, things which are most important. It's the way that I approached looking at success to try and drive that down to nine, nine things that experiences have been. I mean, that seems ridiculous, but it seems to work very well. Um, and so therefore, if people want to be successful, I think they should you know, think about those nine things and nothing else. In investment, I narrowed it down to this question of the star principle because I had seen that from working in large companies, and I thought it probably applied to small companies as well, that it was nearly always true that there were one or two products or one or two types of customer that had driven the success or maybe it was technology, but mm. there was something which had driven the success of the company. And all of that could be expressed and observed um, in one very simple way, you didn't have to know about technology. You didn't have to know about EBITDA multiples or the rest of it. What you needed to look, do was to look at how fast the company was growing, and in particular, how fast the market in which it was situated was growing. And therefore, you know, I, I then started to look for companies which were growing very, very fast. Now, sometimes. It isn't quite as simple as that because sometimes companies can be growing very, very fast, but they're spending a fortune in marketing that maybe they, their investors have poured huge amounts of money. This happened, of course, with the dot com bubble in 1999. You know, all these companies were growing their sales, but they had no business model which was going to ever make money money. And you might have said Amazon was in that category as well because Jeff Bezos didn't care about the profits. He was just going for sales, sales, sales. Um, so therefore, you need to screen out those companies where that is temporary. And the way to do that is to look at the business definition that they're in. What market are they in? And do they dominate that market? Now, again, you need to think very clearly about this because many people would have said, when I invested in Betfair, to take that example, mm -hmm. this is a betting company, which is tiny. It was really, really small. And how could it possibly compete with the big uh, bookmaking firms in London, and London being the centre of legitimate gambling at that time, um, like uh, William Hill or the Tote or Ladbrokes? Um, what you know? How could this company possibly compete against those? And and therefore, a simplistic application of the star principle would say it's not a star; it's a tiny, tiny question mark and yeah, move on to the next company. Um, I had been trained, fortunately, in BCG and in Bain & Company and in my own company, uh, which I co-founded, LEK. I'd been trained to think very carefully about what the boundaries were about those companies. And if a company had a different business model, and if a company had different com uh, competitors, and if it had different customers, then it, you could think about it as being uh, in a separate segment. And it so happened that Betfair had pioneered the idea of a betting exchange, which was no more than an electronic market applied to betting, where people could place buy and sell orders effectively. And the way that betting was organized, if it was organized at all, was by someone, a rich person, making a book, and therefore a bookmaker. And they would set the odds. And of course, they'd set the odds in such a way that in the long run, the punter, unless he had real inside information, couldn't possibly win because there was a 10 or 20% margin. And you see that in casinos. That, you know, every time the roulette wheel spins, if you're in Europe because there's only one zero, it's a 2.7% house advantage. If you're in America because you've got a zero and a zero zero, it, it's a 5.4%, it's a whatever, two times yeah. 2.7. I'm not very good at those particulars. But anyway, that, that, that makes it impossible if you stay in the casino for very long <laughs> to actually win, and the house always wins in the long run. Well, the whole idea of a betting exchange was that that was totally demolished by having this market that they charged a very, very small commission uh, on only on winning bets, and they could survive on that. And 
uh, they didn't have to have anyone trained in setting a book because the customers themselves would do that. They could take either side of the of the bet. They could say, you know, this football team or this horse is, is going to win the race, or it's not. And you could you could uh, bet on all of those things. You could put up bets. You could trade bets before the thing had started, and you could even bet while the race or event was still going on. So electronically, you could do that. You couldn't possibly do that with a bookmaker because you'd have to change the odds so quickly, and you you get creamed because you know other people would see the trend faster than you did because you were only one person and that they were many so um it was a wonderful wonderful idea and their customers were totally different from the typical high street uh, main street customers you know placing bets uh for people in happy valley for example you know people sort of betting on these very exotic bets which are great for the owners of the hong kong jockey club but, but you know, not so great world, for other right? people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just, just absolutely. Well, in fact, the only battle that it, that uh, they never ever lost was when they got to discussions with the Hong Kong Jockey Club. They, <laughs> they, they didn't come out of those discussions with anything useful. Yeah. And the Hong Kong Jockey Club did. But, but nevertheless, you know, so when you looked at it that way, instead of being a tiny player in the huge betting market, Betfair was a... a Big, although still very, very tiny, the biggest, in fact, the dominant, in fact, until uh, another company called Flutter was set up, the only betting exchange and had a very high relative market share, relative market share being your sales, the company's sales divided by the sales of the next largest competitor or the largest if it was larger. So, so I then said, I'm only going to invest in star businesses. Now, sometimes I got it wrong. I thought they were star businesses or recipient star businesses, and it turned out that they weren't. Sometimes they were, but someone bigger, you know, came into the market with more money and eventually replaced them so that they stopped being a star business pretty quickly. Um, but nevertheless, it's that single criterion that makes it very easy. So firstly, the first cut is, is a business growing very fast? And the second cut is, okay, if it's growing very fast, is it the leader in a defensible niche, uh, which uh, in Buffett terms has got a moat around it, you know, which you can defend from, from uh, assailants. And, and in that case, you invest in it. And so you don't have to worry about how good the management was. The reason I was able to invest in Betfair was because they couldn't raise money from any professional um, investor. You know, all of the professional investors have been trained in their mantra, which said that the management team is very important. The management team has got, got to have experience. None of the people who started Betfair, uh, none of the people who worked in Betfair had ever run a company before. They'd come nowhere close to that. You know, and the only things that they were keen on and interested in were either betting or sports in general. So they had no experience in financial management. They had no experience in running a website. They had no experience in anything at all. But, but again, most that anyone came to that was actually the guy who came up with the idea in the first place, a real genius and counter-intuitive uh, counter, uh, sort of person called Bert Black, Andrew Black. And he had been a professional. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that was his experience. You know, so... You know, what happens is the fashion investors pitched up and they talked, if they talked at all, to the people at Betfair and, and they scratched their heads when they came out and said, well, that bunch couldn't have a brewery. So, so, you know, and they weren't far wrong, <laughs> but, but it didn't matter. Exactly. Because my view is that you can always strengthen the management later on if it has to be strengthened. What, what I'm looking for is the power of the idea which can survive even very bad management because the idea itself and the network effect which is generated from other people who wanted to have other people that they could bet with or bet against, um, you know, was so strong that it just grew and grew and grew in the early days very fast. And, you know, everything comes to an end. Eventually, you know, the growth, the growth rate uh, disappeared, but it's still... A, a cash cow business in in the market which is not growing quite so fast as it, it used to grow um but nevertheless the, it's so much bigger than it was that you could make a very good return out of that i think my return on the first tranche of investment in betfair 
was more than 50 times the investment. So, you know, that's what I've always been looking for. Um, and uh, that's, you know, it doesn't take many companies. I mean, I think about the, my success in the last uh, 20 years, and it's probably been driven by four companies, all of which uh, were or are star businesses. Yeah. Out of a sum total of how many bets, Richard, would you say, that four? Um, I, my total portfolio is something like 25 companies. Right. at the moment but some of them have sort of you know fallen by the wayside but they yeah. fell by the wayside before i put very much money in them um yeah and uh none of them did i actually have very large investments in mm -hmm. um so you know i'm always looking for those things which if you simplify if you simplify everything down to one or two principles um uh, you can be very successful and nobody nobody likes reducing things like that because they say well it's not as simple as that richard is it and i say no it's not but i'm going to pretend that it is and it seems to work yeah what other what other principles or behaviors did you adopt from bruce henderson from bill bain when he went on to found lek bain and company had this business philosophy and that was around the idea of only working for the top person in the organization. That distinguished Bain & Company from McKinsey, from BCG, from all the other consulting firms in the world, because none of them had taken the view that they, in a way, they didn't think that they were equals. They thought that their job was to advise companies and that they were a little bit like very intelligent sort of staff officers or very highly trained um, sort of you know geniuses but their job was to advise and it was the company's job to decide what to do things bain and company had a different view bill bain had a different view of the world which, which was it started with the idea that he knew something or they knew something bain and company knew something that nobody else did which was the the secrets of strategic consulting which in those days uh the idea of looking at things purely through the single lens of competitive advantage was not very widespread. It's very widespread now. But nevertheless, uh, he wasn't focusing on, on the tools. He was focusing on the relationship that he and his fellow partners could develop with the top person in the organization. And th there was a kind of unspoken, or perhaps it was spoken, but very softly sort of, you know, um, Concord between the chief executive and Bain and Company, which was, you know, we will do our best to increase the value of your company and to advise on that. Um, and we will make you very successful or we'll help you to be very successful, um, Mr. or Miss Chief Executive. But um, uh, we want it to be understood that we won't work for your competitors because we only want to work for one in one company in an industry or a competitive system and you won't work with ours with our competitors so it's no use you having a study from bain and company and then saying well that was very good but let's you know we hear mckinsey are very good at this so let's go down the road to mckinsey or boston consulting group and come up with this new idea so effectively what he did was to lock Bain and Company, as long as they performed, into a, a, a monopoly situation with the particular client. And therefore, they would also say to the chief executive right at the start, you know, we're going to really perform for you. It's going to be successful. As long as it's successful, we're going to keep recommending to you new studies because it's very important that we, we take every opportunity in all of your divisions, in all of your countries, in all of your important products to get competitive advantage. And we, we expect you, as long as you're getting a very high return on the investment which you're putting into uh, the company, we expect you not to query our budgets. And our budgets are going to seem outrageous to you. Uh, but nevertheless, if you're getting a very high return on those budgets, why should you care about that? And that's what they did. I mean, McKinsey, at the time that I was in Bain & Company, didn't bill a single client a million pounds a year in London, and I, I doubt they, they billed a client a million dollars a year. Uh, this was a long time ago, and obviously money was, was quite valuable then. Um, but nevertheless, 
there was this upstart firm which had been set up, you know, half a dozen years previously. McKinsey had been a venerable consulting firm since the 1930s and had, you know, by far the greatest prestige in the market. It was the company you went to when you knew what you wanted to do, but you wanted a firm to validate it or to, to, to basically give their stamp of approval to it. But nevertheless, McKinsey never had the chutzpah to charge their clients no amount of money or, or the presumption to go yeah. to the client and say, this is what you should hire us for. Not, you know, we hope yeah. to submit a proposal to you. And that's the other thing that Bill Bain did completely differently. He had no written reports. Now, now what Bill Bain says, you know, my the output from my studies, our studies, is decisions. You know, you've got to decide that you're going to put prices up here, or put prices down there, or that you're going to spend more money in marketing or whatever. You know, and that doesn't take a report. And in the early days, they wouldn't even give copies of their presentations to uh, to the clients. You know, they'd say, you know, afterwards, let's talk about, you know, here's the presentation. This is what we think you should do. And next week, we want to have a meeting with the chief executive and nobody else, you know, and talk about what we're going to do about that. And what we're going to do about that was very often that it, we would move into the implementation phase. And of course, Bain and Company would be there to help you implement the study. So then, you know, the budget would go up three times. And, and then, of course, by the time they'd finished and they'd been throughout the whole corporation, it was probably time like painting the fourth row bridge to start painting it again. But, but, but they had a, a better wheeze than that, which was, why don't you acquire this company? And when the company was acquired, they would then go through the whole process again of working in that company <laughs> to do all the things that they didn't. Uh, it was just a huge Incredibly money machine. Smart. But yeah. to be fair, it was, it, was, it was a money machine for the chief executive. I mean, they really did perform. Mm. And when, when they set up a, a Bain Capital, which Mitt Romney uh, was the leader of for several years, um, but in the first 10 years, they actually doubled the value of the portfolio every year, which is far better than either. Yeah. Um, and it was, you know, it, was, it was because the power of the concepts were so great and the analysis was, 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 was very good as well. So again, uh, we run out of time, I know, but I mean, that, that to me says, you know, what Bill Bain did in strategy consulting can be done in any industry. You just have to reinvent the business model. And what, what business model is going to give the customers a great deal, but is actually going to give the company very high growth and very high margins. And it's as simple as that. Yeah, amazing. So I just tried to, for kind of consistency, keep the same final question. So I'll pick one there. So most memorable things anyone has ever said to you, and that could be words from, you know, one of your old mentors or old friends, but is there anything that particularly sticks? Uh, well, it would have to be the story I told earlier about Miss Gates of saying, <laughs> yeah. that, that, you know, you're, uh, you're completely mad. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> that, that think, lower your sights, young man. And uh, it was not advice which I took. Is there any advice that was... Uh, that was taken. I think it would probably be the, the, the thing that Bill Bain said that um, don't let action drive out thought. And this, this was something that was notable for him because he was sitting when we deigned to go into the office, which wasn't very often. He was much more comfortable on the tennis court. But, but when he went into the office, he had this marvelous, huge office. Uh, which was beautiful and, uh, you know, it was an oasis of calm and zen. Uh, and he would sit and think. At the same time, everyone else in the organization, hundreds of people would be rushing around in very cramped, very nice offices, but very cramped offices. You know, they were, they were certainly doing things. But he was doing the thinking for them in a way because the structure of the company that he set up, he was very clear what he wanted done. And the people who ran projects were very clear what they wanted done. And there were people who did things and there were people who thought. But nevertheless, Bill Bain was always saying that to people. He was trying to get them to think about what they were doing as well as, as doing it. Don't let action drive out thought. To go to a new breakthrough, you need to think things through from first principles. And there's no limit to the number of new ideas that people can come up with. And of course, when you've got a new idea, you've got to then do it. Most people don't. But nevertheless, it's the power of the idea, which in my view drives success, whether people realize it or not. Brilliant. 
Well, thank you so much, Richard. I don't want to eat up more of your time. You've been very generous already. Um, I would love to do a part two with you if you're up to it further down the line. But um, thank you so much once again for joining me. Absolutely. Very much like to do that, Michael. Thank you very much indeed. And good luck. Um, I've very much enjoyed talking to you. Thank you. As always, my two minute takeaways from today's chat. The value of having a handful of principles to guide your decision making. Being an utter reductionist can be extremely helpful if you are able to accurately assess the 20% of activities and inputs that contribute to 80% of your success. Having the right instruments in your mental toolbox helps you to cut through the noise and avoid paralysis by analysis. The 80-20 principle in life, the star principle in investment, Doubling down on one's natural strengths rather than trying to bring obvious weaknesses up to sufficiency, this is what brought Richard an unreasonable level of success. Sometimes the best thing that you can do when things aren't working out is just to quit, move on to something else. And we can get caught up in the sunk cost fallacy very easily that we've invested a certain amount of time and energy or money on something and we need to stick it out. And actually, if you're going to be successful, You have to go where your talents and your interests best match the prevailing culture. Remarkable people can often appear very average if they are in the wrong environment. Richard's talent for business development, managing client relationships vis-a-vis his relative lack of mathematical prowess, um, in his case was not particularly valued at BCG, but that skill set was enormously valuable at their greatest rivals, Bain & Company, where winning the trust of CEOs was of primary importance. Exact same industry, different culture. He got fired from one and made partner at the other. So one's environment can make an enormous difference to one's prospects. If you feel undervalued or feel like you're swimming against the tide, try to find a career path where you feel like you're swimming with the current instead. Everyone's power zone will be different. A good question to ask yourself that might bring some clarity. What feels like play to you but looks like work to others? What comes naturally to you that other people find difficult? Richard's life is now all about finding flow activities. For him, that's writing, that's investing, that's having interesting conversations. And isn't that what we all want? The time and space to do meaningful, enjoyable work, immersed in a state of flow? I'm reminded of the famous Ralph Waldo Emerson quote. As to methods, there may be a million and then some, but principles are few. The man who grasps principles can successfully select his own methods. The man who tries methods, ignoring principles, is sure to have trouble. That's it from me. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Richard. If you did, please ensure that you've clicked subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, CastBox, whatever your favorite podcatcher may be, so that you can see the full show notes and get notified when a new episode drops. If you'd like a little more background to the show or want to sign up to my weekly newsletter, Thursday Thoughts, which is a little curation of the best things I've been reading and listening to on the internet in the preceding week, you can do so at www.michaelxcampion.com. Far more interesting are Richard's social accounts. You can follow him on Twitter at richardkosh8020, or you can check out his website, richardkosh.net. That's K-O-C-H, richardkosh.net. So you can see what he's up to. I will be back very soon with another amazing guest. Thank you so much for tuning in. In the meantime, take care and much love.